Greetings, everyone. This is Elijah with the Side Hustler Society podcast. And today I'm going to be uh, rocking solo on this episode because we're going to be discussing a, a pressing topic that I think is very important. Is the gig economy a uh, drug? And the reason I'm going to be rocking solo is because I'm going to share some of my individual uh, story with the uh, gig economy. And um, a lot of people that I bring on, with the exception of a few people, they don't really have an extensive history with the gig economy like I do. So I think uh, this episode will roll a little smoother if I actually just uh, do it myself. Now, for those of y'all that don't know what the gig economy is, what you think of the gig economy might depend on exactly uh, when you were born. If you're uh, some of the older folks listening, the gig economy or just been a gig worker is actually synonymous with being a freelancer, or at least it was. So if you were a gig worker, that was just another way of saying you're a freelancer. You know, I'm a photographer, graphic designer. I uh, I have I'm a plumber. These were basically gigs that you did for doing money. But right along the time when Uber and Lyft and all these apps that you can use to make money popped on the scene, the term gig worker became synonymous with uh, doing these apps. And then people just start using freelancer for any type of a contracting work, per se. Uh, technically, uh, the, doing these apps, you're independent contractor, so technically you're a contractor. But I think y'all get what I'm uh, articulating here. There's a gig worker, then there's a freelancer. And a gig worker nowadays means that you're multi-apping or doing like some app to make money like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, that kind of thing. But we're going to go ahead and hop into the uh, show. Let's get the intro out of the way, and then we can get into it. Welcome to the Side Hustler Society Podcast with your host, Elijah Bilal. This is where you can find out more about hustles that are best for you. And of course, make more money in the process. Elijah has been in the gig economy and freelance space for over five years and has done over 3,000 deliveries on Uber Eats. He's an Airbnb super host, runs multiple YouTube channels, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Anatomy of Financial Success. It's his mission to empower people with the tools needed to be successful. Now, welcome your host, the king of side hustles, Elijah Bilal. What's up, everyone? This is Elijah, your host, and as mentioned in the intro, we're going to be talking about the gig economy. So I want to start this conversation out with a quote from Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Before You Quit Your Job. And it's more of a paraphrase instead of an exact quote, because I don't remember the exact quote that he said. But uh, his rich dad was schooling Robert on some a key game when it came to making money. He was talking about the cash flow quadrant. For those of y'all that are unaware, uh, the cash flow quadrant is uh, something that's unique to the Rich Dad Poor Dad brand. There's uh, categories of making money and the split up in a the quadrant. There's a E stands for employee. In fact, you know what? We're going to go ahead and Google the quadrant just so y'all can get a uh, you know, visual of what I'm talking about. A lot of y'all may be familiar with it, but, you know, just be patient for those who aren't. Okay. So, actually, this is a, a great depiction right here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And click on percent. Okay. So, as y'all can see on the screen, the S, it has four quadrants. E-S-B-I. The E stands for employee, the S stands for small business or self-employed, the B stands for business owner, and uh, Robert classifies a business owner in this category as big business, at least 500 employees or more, and I stands for investor. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen right now. And uh, this phrase that I'm going to share, Rich Dad was basically telling uh, Robert that you need to be careful about the ways that you earn money because Earning money is a habit that turns into an addiction. And a lot of people make it, it's challenging for them to switch from one quadrant to another quadrant because it's an addiction and they don't start making enough money for them with another quadrant for them to emotionally switch over. So he is telling him the process of moving from S to B. And 
how he needed to get out of his own way to build more systems to have people do work for him instead of him doing it himself. I think that's a uh, very important, specifically the part about uh, making money in certain ways is an addiction. I want you to actually think about this. When you get paid, if especially a uh, decent money, or I'll just say when you get paid in general, uh, it gives you back control of your life. You can pay your bills. You can, uh, pay for stuff that uh, you can use just to have some fun. So you do something, then you receive money, you get a little hit of dopamine, and then you repeat the process after you spend said money or save it or whatever you're going to do. That creates a pattern that when you try and do something new when making money, you may find it mostly challenging because you're associated all that control and fun with making money in this certain way. In fact, this is one of the things, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you need to kind of break out of because there are opportunities around the corner and it may require you to learn new skill sets and actually work for free so you can learn those skill sets. So it's something that you got to learn how to mostly break if you're going to be an entrepreneur. But not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. That's beside the point. The point is uh, making money in certain ways can be an addiction. And I think this is very, it runs parallel to these uh, gig workers. And the reason I'm going to be talking about this is because I was, and you to some degree you could say I'm still am a gig worker. Every now and then I'll get out there, uh, deliver some food for Uber Eats while I'm knocking out an audio book. But um, a lot of people just talk about the gig economy. They talk about it in the context of never actually been in an Uber or Lyft or delivering food with DoorDash. It's always from the third person perspective. And no, I don't mean like you've done like 10, 20, 30 trips or whatever. You know, oh, I did it for a little bit. That qualifies me to talk about it. No. A lot of people, especially on YouTube and on these articles, they comment about the gig economy, but they have never done it. You're talking to someone who has about 4,000 deliveries between Uber Eats and DoorDash under my belt. Uh, Rideshare-wise, I have about 500 uh, trips. Obviously, I have more deliveries than uh, Rideshare because I decided to focus on doing deliveries back in the day. But my point is, I have experience with this stuff. I've been a gig worker full-time. Uh, a lot of people do this part time, but the people I'm really talking about today, they do this uh, stuff full time. And I don't think you should be doing it full time for any longer than a year, in my opinion, because it's actually not very secure work. I mean, if you just turn the wheel the wrong way, Uber may have a problem with it and deactivate you. You might say, well, I'm signed up for multiple apps and that is very true. But it doesn't change the fact that uh, the gig economy is supposed to be a placeholder while you get something else off the ground. It's not supposed to be something you stay in that long. That something else could be uh, acquiring a trade or a skill. It could be going to college. It could be a number of things. But there needs to be a next step. And not enough gig workers have a next step. So for me, and I did share my whole origin story in my very first episode. So if you want to know the details of what I'm saying, Feel free to check that episode out. It's going to be linked in the uh, show notes. But for me, the uh, gig economy was always a means to an end because I saw an opportunity. Originally, I was involved in network marketing, but um, I decided that wasn't the way that I wanted to make a lot of money with for my own reasons I went into in that show. Again, you know, feel free to check it out. But then I bumped into, uh, you know, Uber. Well, not bumped into. I'd already done Uber before, but not like anything that serious. But I decided to play around with being an Uber driver and then learned about Lyft a little later. So I tacked that on. Then Uber, Eats, uh, Uber kept begging me to do Uber Eats, which I rejected because they didn't have tipping at the time. But when they added it, I decided, you know, it couldn't hurt. I'll give it a try. Did Uber Eats. Turned out I liked it a little better. Well, I liked the fact that I could listen to anything in the car better. So I could learn like a lot about various things. If we're talking about which one I actually like better, not including that between food and rice here, I actually like rice here better. Probably because I'm a people person. I love talking to people. I love taking the college students around SMU all over the city, having these uh, unique conversations about anime and TV shows and who they're dating at the time. <laughs> it really takes me back. And I really did like uh, having conversations with the uh, the CEOs and accountants I would be taking to the airport or from the airport to their homes. Uh, since I was studying a lot of business stuff at the time, like I could hang in there and talk to them about a lot of things and they were just genuinely impressed. And that resulted in having a nice tip, which was the whole point of that conversation. How many gig workers can relate to that? You know, just kind of uh, relating to your customer just so you can get 
I'm not going to say just so you can get a sip. I do it regardless. But, you know, a tip is just an extra incentive. But um, I, I digress. Uh, that's how I got started with the uh, in a, a, a full time way, the gig economy. But I carved out a game plan because I saw, hey, this is a good opportunity. And uh, I don't think it's going to be around in its current form forever. So I'm going to use this to get from point A to point B. What was the point A to point B story? Well, the whole plan was, okay, I always had an interest in YouTube. I can talk about this gig economy stuff, specifically Uber Eats, because there's a hole in the marketplace. No one was talking about Uber Eats on YouTube at the time. And they're talking about food delivery in general. Like, yeah, there's someone that was talking specifically about DoorDash. He had a lot of channels that talked about all the apps, food delivery, but no one that just focused on Uber Eats. And they are missing a lot of the key components that are unique to Uber Eats to master making money with that platform. So I just focused on the Uber Eats at first. But my point is, I can make a YouTube channel surrounded around uh, Uber Eats or the gig economy. Uh, make some nice referrals because the referral program for um, these apps back in the day was a lot. Um, if you want to know details about that, check out uh, my episode, not episode, uh, my video on uh, financial anatomy, and it'll be linked in the show notes. Well, I share how I made uh, over $12,000 just spending $260. That's where I go into the details of that referral program. But I can make some referral money. I can uh, get the channel monetized. And when the channel is monetized, I can start branching off into personal finance content because that's a more evergreen um more appealing to the masses of the people category. What I mean by that is uh, personal finance applies to everyone, a large amount of people who need to learn personal finance versus obviously the gig economy is, uh, is very niche. Once that's done, then I was going to take the money off the personal finance category and then go into real estate. That was the whole game plan in its entirety. It's taken different forms, but I more or less achieved it by different forms. Uh, I did that initially, but uh, people didn't respond to the personal finance content on the app Lifestyle the way I wanted to. So I made a separate channel called Financial Anatomy, which is a lot bigger than uh, the app Lifestyle at this point. And then I took the uh, proceeds from Financial Anatomy and freelancing to get involved with Airbnb, which uh, to some degree is a version of real estate. Now, some people say that's a hospitality business. I, I can totally respect that. I mean, it fits the categories. But just for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to say that help me branch off into real estate. You see how I outlined like a game plan from point A to point B? This is why I want for more gig workers to do because um, I, a lot of times people are kind of thrust into the gig economy and you're kind of in a state of flux. And we enter these flux states in our lives at some point, like something unexpected may happen and then you just need to do something to pay the rent. And you might just find yourself just doing that something for two or three months, just trying to figure out what the next step is. But then the next step either comes in your mind or someone suggests it, and you get started on moving towards that next step, and you're supposed to get out. The problem is this in-between stage has lasted way too long, or sometimes it's indefinitely for people. Uh, you have people in the gig economy that's been at it for years full-time, and I, that's not the best place to be in. So what I'm going to do now, I'm actually going to share um, my earnings because this I don't want this to be a recap of my first episode. So I'm going to go into some specifics of uh, exactly what I made last month just to provide some uh, inspiration and also some context for context from um, gig workers. Because I want you all to remember that all this is coming from a former gig worker. If you want to, you can include me as a gig worker now since I do do it. Sometimes, but it is less than five hours. So if you don't want to count me as a gig worker, I totally understand that. But um, I want y'all to all remember that I'm coming from being a gig worker. And uh, gig workers, I hate to um, put it in this context, but some people say it falls in the category of unskilled labor. The only exception is if you uh, get a commercial license and then you start your own like a business around this where you're driving high affluent clients around the uh, city. And then Uber and Lyft is more just a, you know, a lead generator for you. That's different, but that's not most people's uh, situation. But you can change unskilled labor into me as skilled labor because the gig economy provides you a unique opportunity. You have control of your schedule, so you can learn whatever you need to learn to take the next step to get on with your life in terms of making money. 
And we're going to conclude this podcast by giving you uh, five tips that will help you do so, because this is basically what I follow. So let's get on the process of uh, sharing my screen. Okay. So um, I'm going to make y'all a deal. I am only going to be uh, sharing uh, steady income. I'm, I'm using uh, financial anatomy as terminology, but there, there's two types of uh, income in this regard. The steady income and unste unsteady income. You know, steady income is money that's coming in on a regular basis. It rises slowly or falls slowly. So you'll get a heads up if you really need to pivot into something else. Unsteady income is it's just goes in cycles. It has extremely big highs and it can have big lows. Like unsteady income, an example is uh, the Uber referrals back in the day. Sometimes I make like $500 per month from uh, Uber referrals. Another time I can make $2,500. It's a pretty big gap, right? This kind of goes up and down, up and down. I'm not going to be talking about unsteady income because if we're talking about you moving to the next step, you need security, you need uh, stability. So you need that steady income. You don't want to put all your energy into unsteady income because it's just too capricious. Build something that's steady. So I'm not going to be talking about uh, book sales. I'm not going to be talking about affiliate marketing because those are unsteady. We're going to be talking about the stable sources of income by our top. Uh, three stable sources of income. And remember, all this was birth from me being in the gig economy. I couldn't build this stuff without the time and control over my schedule. So what we have on the screen here is I am uh, on uh, my uh, Airbnb page. We're going to go to uh, earnings. Let's go down. And we're going to click on September. And you see, I've made a, a little over $5,000 in the month of September on uh, Airbnb. Now, I will say this. If y'all want to see a show where I break down like my expenses and like total profit on all my income sources, hey, let me know. We might uh, take a look at doing that. But we're going to pop the calculator out and we're going to do some math. So that's 5007 for Airbnb as a source of uh, income. Now I am. I do have my units on a VRBO. Uh, just for context, I currently have two apartment units on a Airbnb that I rent out and uh, rent to uh, people on a short-term or mid-term basis. And I'm uh, working on getting the third unit, but the third unit is not uh, taken off the ground yet. It's still being built, so that's not included because I haven't made any money from it. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to YouTube. And we'll start with uh, the app lifestyle since that's where I started on YouTube. And we're going to look at the income uh, generated from last month. Go to a uh, YouTube studio. And my computer wants to take its sweet time. <laughs> okay, good. So going to go to analytics. We're going to look at last month. Uh, like, like I said before, we're not looking at any affiliate revenue generated from here. Click on September. And uh, the total revenue that's pulled from the app lifestyle is $73.37. Uh oh, <laughs> looks like I've got a low battery. If y'all excuse me, I need to go grab my charger. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. That uh, caught me by surprise. So, <laughs> all right. So the uh, app lifestyle, we got $73.37. Next, we're going to go to the uh, the bigger of the two, financial anatomy. Okay. Go to analytics. And I'm going to be honest, I've actually been slacking on the, the YouTube front. I've been more focused on the Airbnb front, and that's uh, no excuse. I need to uh, start uploading more videos, so this number actually should be a lot higher. But go to September and uh, see it's $1,225.85. Let's add that in there.
And uh, last, I do still have uh, freelance uh, clients. And uh, I, I call this category just uh, client services. Now, every, sometimes I do have sponsorships involved, but I didn't have any in the uh, month of September. So we're just going to be going off of uh, one of my uh, biggest clients <clears throat> that I'm on retainer for. And uh, the amount that I was paid in September was uh, $1,750. It's going to add that in there. 1750. And uh, I'm going to say equal. And as y'all uh, can see, I made a total of uh, $8,056.22 in the uh, month of September. And it's come from uh, three income sources one, freelancing. And for me, freelancing means uh, video editing um, and uh, website designing. But for the month of September, that was just uh, video editing. And uh, the other two sources are rental arbitrage from Airbnb or short term rentals, making money that way, and uh, from YouTube. So we're going to get off of here. Stop sharing my screen before we all get eye damage <laughs> through the uh, live stream tunnel. <laughs> but I share all that to uh, say that for gig workers, we all have a very, very unique opportunity. Even if you uh, find yourself working like 50 or 60 hours just to stay afloat, you do have control over your schedule. So if you follow the tips that um, I'm about to outline right now, you can find yourself moving on with your life and doing uh, less of this gig work, which let's just be honest, it's meant to be temporary. Don't turn it into something permanent. So tip number one is to steadily start decreasing your um, gig hours that you put into the gig economy. Now, this will be a more applicable tip once you do the other tips, but let's just start with this one. Let's say you're doing... Uh, 60 hours in the gig economy right now every month try and reduce it by five hours so the next month now you're just doing 55 hours the next month now you're just doing 50 hours the month after that now you're just doing 45 hours you're going to gradually work your way down to where you're part-time and then if you want to you could get rid of the gig economy altogether uh, me personally, I don't think I'll ever get rid of it completely because I really do like the fact that a delivery is a great way to consume audiobooks because it's just you and a burrito in the car. And uh, to make things even more appealing, the burrito is not going to attack you. Y'all yeah, seen some of those rideshare videos nowadays. Just make sure y'all keep taking proper precautions, like uh, keeping the doors locked before anyone gets in your vehicle, things like that. But um, I digress. But um, while you're doing this, Actually, I just kind of jumped into uh, tip number two in an indirect way. My ne next tip was going to be listen to videos and podcasts uh, that you have interest in. Well, let me rephrase that. Listen to videos and podcasts surrounded around your potential interests to make money in. So if you have an interest in graphic design, start listening to podcasts and videos about it. If you have an interest in plumbing, start listening to videos and podcasts about it. Any kind of thing you have interest in, you should be gathering information on it. And unless uh, you're going to school to uh, get a job, I think the natural route for most gig workers is going to be getting some kind of trade uh, or skill because that'll allow you to actually uh, build some uh, income up pretty fast. This isn't a tip, but I do recommend y'all watch that show I did on freelancing if you're looking at how to get started in that. Because the one thing about the gig economy, it provides you the benefits of a freelancer without acquiring the skills or putting in the effort to do so i, I want you to think about this a freelancer can they they, they can basically uh, work when they want to work and make as much money as they want to make it's all dependent on their effort and these are very sought after characteristics of make of some way of making money but when you enter the gig economy, you get to get those benefits, but you didn't put in the work of getting your own clients, of getting like a trader skill to get it. This is why the gig economy can be so addicting, because you get access to these benefits without necessarily putting in that work. So we want to uh, flip that on its head. And it comes with a risk as well. Like I said, you can piss these companies off and they say, all right, you got to go. And there's not really anything you can do about it. Yes, you can drive for their competitors, but like the same applies for their competitors, too. It's like it's a walking on eggshell scenario. You don't want to be dealing with that uh, long term. In, in my opinion, that's even more risky than uh, potentially getting fired from a job. But uh, 
follow tips one and two. That's a great start. And that's a good segue into tip number three. Uh, tip number three is to attend events about these interests. And when I say events, I mean live in-person events. I know we live in the world of virtual events, but that's no. The point is to actually meet people that are aligned with your interests because they have the same interest in making money that way. So it's just networking on purpose. Make some new friends and uh, y'all can push each other to uh, reach y'all's individual goals, whether it's a direct way, meaning that like, you can hit each other up saying, like, hey, what are you up to? Make sure y'all are both heading towards making more money in that field. Or if it's an indirect way, you just happen to look at them the next time you talk to them, they met, they're a few strides ahead of you. It's so like, uh, I don't want to feel that way. Let me catch up. Some good peer pressure is not a bad thing in this industry. Let me tell you that. Um, next, you want to try uh, new things. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be related to uh, making money. But I try new things. I mean, anything. A lot of gig workers become uh, very solitary, very solo players if this was a video game. So don't be like that. Have some fun every now and again. Go shoot some pool. Go play some darts. Do some activities that you've never done before. I mean, um, I showed this off in a freelance video, but I've never been, I had never done trapeze before, which is this uh, aerial trick that they do like in the circus. And there's this uh, big safety net. Well, it's a safety net for us when we're doing it <laughs> in the circus. I don't, I don't think there's a safety net, but they've done it a thousand times at that point. But I, I, I don't know. Okay. I'm not, I don't have a degree in the circus. So correct me if you want. That's just my assumption. But the point is, it's a very risky, very quote unquote dangerous because you get up there, they teach you how to do tricks in the air, and then you fall on this net. A lot of people will consider that scary. I did it just because I like facing my fears and it's, you know, provided some adrenaline, some excitement. And, you know, I actually met a few contacts there that um, I keep in touch with to this day. That's what I mean by trying some new things. You'll meet some people. But uh, this is separate from the first tip. I mean, from the third tip, because uh, these don't have to be money related. Plus, it just gets you in the habit of enjoying life. Uh, gig workers can suffer from what I call hustle hard mentality. Yeah, we're going to go full ace hood in there. But um, all they do is hustle, 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 doing all this striving, making uh, all this money. And um, th they end up just not having a life. And, you, you know, you want to have the good things in life. Because this is what's going to provide you the motivation to actually break out of this cycle and make money some other way uh, that has more passive benefits or just makes more money in a more enjoyable way for you. Because if you don't have uh, motivation to do this, you're not going to do it. So the less you're in the gig economy, the more time you have to do stuff like this. That's why you need to start. And the fifth tip is to uh put in work so if you follow these steps you're going to eventually find something that you're interested in you're going to find some trade some skill that you want to do and once you've uh, done this just put in the work towards learning that it could be uh, something where you don't really need any formal education for i was i didn't go to school for video editing but i have three youtube channels that you, you saw the money they pull in uh this podcast that later uh in probably the latter part of next year is going to be monetized at least adsense revenue wise so clearly my video editing skills are monetizable and i've also monetized them uh, directly for people paying for my services it's all because i learned how to do it but you know some trades may require a certification or a trade school you know plumbing uh something like that or you know for the ladies a stylist or even for the dudes what, what about barber school I'm just throwing ideas out there, but once you decide what you want to do, put in the work. And when it comes to putting in the work, once you have the trade or skill, then just listen to the episode I did on freelancing, and you'll be set to go as long as you're sincere and willing to put in the work. You can gradually start moving away from this gig economy stuff so that it can just be something you do in your spare time if you choose to do so. Because this stuff is meant to be something to fill the void while you're in the flux period, depending just trying to figure out what you're going to do next. If you don't know what that next step is, it's very kind of dangerous to stay here too long because, uh, you know, you are getting older. And if you're going to think about going back to the workforce, the longer you stay out of it, uh, usually the worse off you're going to be. And in the freelancing world, 
the younger you are, the easier it is to learn these habits of a freelancer because we're generally raised to be employees. And when you enter the freelancing world, if, if we're going to go to Robert Kiyosaki's uh, cash flow quadrant, the freelancing world is the world of the S quadrant. Very different rules, very different habits, very different emotionally. You can make that switch, but the more set in your ways you are in the E quadrant, the harder the switch is going to be. So why not start that conquest sooner than later? Of course, the only difference is if you are just looking for another job. Um, I would actually be aggressively doing that. Some people who are looking for jobs get too complacent in the gig economy. Not really doing everything they could to, uh, you know, find a new job. Let's be honest. So like uh, they're not on LinkedIn, you know, making contacts, you know, trying to instigate an interview. They're not applying at all the sites they could be applying to. They're not attending events in their field to maybe bump into the right person that can get them an interview. No, it's kind of like, oh, I applied to a few jobs this month. But, you know, I didn't get them. So, you know, whatever. I'm just going to keep driving for Uber and Lyft or whatever. Don't be that dude. Actually, put in the work to go ahead and get you um some employment that's usually in a higher paying job. Okay. So with that being said, um, that is five tips that can help you move away from the gig economy. And I've expressed why I think that the gig economy is an addiction. It can be an addiction and uh, how you can break out of it. Because standing there too long. Even with the game plan, you know, generally isn't a, a good idea. I mean, um, overall for me, I was in the game for maybe about six months before I started implementing my game plan. Uh, that's when I started the uh, the app lifestyle. And it, it was a good in-between thing for me to do while I was trying to figure out exactly what my next step was because I decided I didn't want to keep doing the network marketing. Not going to go into why because I did in that other episode I said. So feel free to check that out. But like I said, it's supposed to be an in-between spot in, in your career. So that does it for this episode of the Side Hustler Society podcast. If you're on YouTube and watching us, if you could uh, give us a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, it's greatly appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new, if you want to be keeping up with the content that comes out. And if you're listening on uh, the go, then uh, feel free to leave us a review. It's uh, very much appreciated. And it helps with the podcast getting out there to help more people. With that being said, this is Elijah Blau with the Side Hustler Society podcast. I'll catch you in the next episode. Be safe and be profitable, everyone. This episode may be over, but your hustling journey has just started. Visit the SideHustleSociety.com to access all links and resources mentioned in the show that will help you on your hustler's journey.